Hi folks, Rudy Green here. Uh, I wanted to make a video talking about the answers that uh, were posted up on Thor recently from Jack. And this is going to be a video about the Force Fen treasure hunt, so if you're not really interested in that sort of thing, um, this is your warning. <laughs> Anyways, uh, there was a list of answers that were posted um, from Jack that were from various searchers. Uh, most of these we had seen over the last couple of months. But um, it was just kind of interesting to see them all put together in one place, and I thought it would be fun to go over them and tell you what I see in there and what insights I might have about it. Um, I didn't find the treasure chest, so who knows if my opinion is actually useful. But um, uh, before I get into them, uh, I just want to state so you kind of know where I'm coming from. I, I do believe that Jack is the finder of Forrest Fenton's treasure chest. Um, there's a lot of debate about that. I, I think it's kind of ridiculous to think that Forrest would set somebody up to take control of something. I think he was more the type of person who uh, kept that thing to himself. I don't know, though. It's just an opinion. So, but when I, when I mentioned the finder... Uh, I'm referring to Jack specifically because I think he's probably the finder and he's provided the best evidence thus far of being the finder. So let's bring up uh, the questions and Jack's answers. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to kind of go through these and comment on them with my opinions. So uh, first one here says... Does WWWH have to do with physical water? And Jack answers yes. Uh, that's something I think most of us knew. Uh, maybe no is the wrong word, but something that most of us suspected. Uh, there was there were some imaginative searchers that had worked on ideas that were uh, more theoretical, like tears or well, tears are real, but you know, not in terms of like a physical geographic. Um, water feature. But I think uh, Jack's ruling those out here, if you believe him. Um, there was also, I don't know if this was ever confirmed, but there was also this statement that supposedly came from Forrest telling a searcher to dip their toe, or asking if they could dip their toe in WWWH, uh, which was, whether or not it was warm, definitely signaled that this was a physical water feature we're talking about. You'd have to fact check me on that. I don't know for sure. Uh, that that was a real quote, but it's possibly out there. All right, uh, second part of the first question. If so, was the water actually hot or warm? And Jack's response is, warmth is relative, but to Forrest, yes. Interesting. Um, the, the fact that he has to clarify that there you know, warmth, warmth is relative, and of course there's a story in The Thrill of the Chase, Teachers with Ropes, uh, that gives this specific example of why warmth is relative to a human. But it doesn't really answer the question of why warmth would be relative to forest, because Jack's answer here is conditional. Uh, the area could be warm to forest, but not necessarily warm to everyone. So... You crack that, you probably have our warm water salts. Uh, number three, how far did you have to walk from your vehicle? And Jack does not answer. So uh, my own opinion is I think it's a I think it's a shorter distance. I'm I'm in the probably less than a thousand feet from where you park camp, but that's purely opinion. I don't have uh, evidence to back that up. The next question says, Forrest said to read the thrill of the chase normally and then memorize his poem and go back and read his book slowly and look for hints to help with clues in the poem. He also said that if you mix the hint and clue into a catalyst, it would give you this, and that would be a map to the treasure. Um, I'll just interrupt. I, I don't think Forrest ever has even used the word catalyst. Uh, I don't remember that ever being a thing. So the this, this searcher seems slightly confused. Uh, Jack's response, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure if he had a very specific catalyst in mind. Yeah, he seems to kind of dismiss this as well. Uh, I think appreciating all the context and looking at the big picture opened things up for me. And I'm sure, in general at least, that's what he was talking about. 
because of how Jack uses the phrase big picture, um, which is a phrase that Forrest used once and has been talked about innumerable times since, including people looking for the largest physically big picture in the thrill of the chase, or uh, I think there was that painting by an, uh, an artist with the last name of Brown of the Yellowstone Falls. It was a, um, it's in the Smithsonian, if I remember correctly. You have to check on that for me. Uh, but I think big picture, uh, this, this sort of confirms all along that the big picture was, you know, the whole story. Um, and not focusing on all these individual details that make up the clues. There's something that ties it all together. Um, I don't know. All right, let's go on to question number three. You disclose the chest was found in Wyoming. Can you say what county? No, you will not tell us what county. Uh, somebody asked about the canopy of stars, if that was relevant to the... Um, to the correct solution, and Jack says it was just being poetic. Let's scroll down here a little bit. Ooh, this is a good one. The exact location of the treasure. If you were free, this is the question, if you were free and clear of any legal worries, would you want other searchers who developed a fondness of Forrest and his chase over the years to know the special spot? Jack answers. And notice this is a multi-part answer. He says, if I could be, number one, assured the spot wouldn't be destroyed. He's setting up parameters that uh, <laughs> can never all be true. Because, of course, you can't be assured that the spot wouldn't be destroyed. And Jack has already said he'll never release the solution. Um, and that Forrest was okay with it. Also impossible to know, because uh, Forrest isn't around to speak his opinion on that. He may have had an opinion at the time that Jack found it or thereafter, but you know, that opinion would, in theory, drift over time. Um, and maybe Forrest was concerned about the spot being destroyed, too. We don't know. He didn't say. Uh, and then his last condition, and most of them just wanted it to be handed to them, referring to the searchers. That sort of comes across a little to me as uh, <laughs> almost, almost a little bit mean-spirited. Uh, it's like, just wanted it to be handed to them. And I'm not sure that there's definitely some people who just want it to be handed to them. I'm in the camp that I would like to I would like to solve it, but I've already put in a massive amount of effort to no uh, conclusion. So I'm not sure the value of uh, putting in putting in way more effort. And that's not asking it to be handed to me. I've already put in the work. Uh, I just did I did all the wrong work. <laughs> Uh, I guess I just don't want to do the right work. Um, then he says, then sure. So he lists off three conditions that would never all be, you know, true. So uh, it's really, if, if anything, this is a, is a sort of lighthearted way of saying, no, this is not going to change. Um, there's a, <clears throat> there's an answer about the blaze, uh, talking about the person asks if it uh, uh, if it's beginning to grow back. Probably somebody who was searching in an area that was damaged by forest fires. Uh, and Jack responds, not the sort of thing, referring to the blaze, that would grow back into a blaze. Doesn't really tell us a whole lot about the blaze. Um, but for your tree people, might not be a tree. I'll have more to say about the blaze in a minute because there's another question that gets really interesting down here. Uh, somebody asks if he had other pictures. He says, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in looking for things to help solve the puzzle. So I'm going to skip over some of these. Um, somebody asks, would you be willing to answer the question about the distance between where warm waters halt and the blaze? And Jack says, I never calculated it. Uh, which means probably a lot of us have gone in Google Earth and drawn pins between various points on a map and used that as a confirmation bias to connecting certain clues together. 
Um, if you, for example, had a solve where two of the clues are connected by 8.25 miles or, you know, roughly that, you might have used that to um, give, your, give your solve extra validity that it did not deserve. And it appears that Jack is ruling those out because he, if he never calculated those sorts of distances, then that probably wasn't part of figuring points. Um, probably has a lot less to do with, uh, you know, mechanical distances like that. And instead, it seems to be more geography based. Now, this is a two part question, I think asked by the same person, because they were submitted uh, two minutes apart. And uh, it says, did the damage to the blaze affect the look quickly down clue? And then the second part of that was, was wondering what Forrest said about the damaged blaze. And Jack answers the first part of that, and he says, I think the damage didn't have a major effect on that part. He, meaning Forrest, thought it was a possibility, but was surprised it happened so early in the chase. This is one of those questions and answers that actually tells us something useful, something really useful, because he indicates that whatever, whatever happened to the blaze, whatever damaged it in the end, this was something, an event that Forrest was aware of that could take the blaze out. Uh, probably one of the events that was listed in uh, a different Q&A that was done years ago with Forrest where he mentions, he, he specifically mentions a bunch of natural events, uh, you know, forest fires, mudslides, earthquakes. Um, you could look it up and see the exact list, but he's, he was indicating like natural events that could damage the clues. And um, so there was an event um, that damaged the blaze, according to Jack. And Forrest had thought about that event occurring ahead of time. He says here he thought it was a possibility, but he was surprised that it happened so early in the chase. So whatever event happened was one that was unlikely to happen for, you know, at least as long as maybe the medium of what Forrest thought the chase would last. He had given us answers of, you know, from anywhere between in his lifetime to a thousand years. So he's probably talking about an event that would be unlikely to occur um, in the short term. In fact, Jack says that specifically. Uh, Forrest was surprised it happened so early in the chase, it here being the event. So what was the event? Um, I don't think it was a forest fire. And I don't think it was a forest fire because if you believe Jack's account, you wouldn't be able to... Uh, Jack, Jack says that he didn't know what the blaze was when he first searched in early 2018. And he didn't find out what the blaze was until later that fall. And then he went and searched and he had to reevaluate things again and consider that the blaze may have been damaged. So that means that Jack went searching for a blaze a blaze that he knew, or at least had high confidence in at the time, of being how he had solved that clue, and he couldn't find it. This is speaking in the 2019 search season. And he went back home and he went, I wonder if the blaze got damaged. And if the blaze had gotten damaged, what would that result look like and how would that change how I'm doing my boots on the ground? So if he didn't consider that the blaze could have been damaged until after he had gotten, um, after he had gotten home, it wasn't something that was physically obvious on site. That rules out forest fires 100%. Because if you were searching in an area and there was a forest fire and all the trees were burned down and you thought that maybe the blaze had been on a tree, 
you would have considered that while you were there looking for a blaze on the tree. That's just logic. So, yeah, I, I think we can rule out, I think we can rule out any physical damage to the immediate terrain that would, uh, that would not be, I mean, that would be obvious, you know, because otherwise, if there had been obvious physical damage to that little section of forest, you would, uh, you would consider that while you were there boots on the ground. And because Jack didn't consider it until after that, I just, uh, I think it had to be a non or a less visible form of damage. So that could be earthquakes. Uh, earthquakes could shake things. So let's say there's maybe some sort of rock situation that's marking the spot. Well, that's going to sort of shake things out. Um, we do know that that area up in northwest Wyoming is earthquake prone. It's, uh, it's the only area in the Rocky Mountains that has had active earthquakes in the last, uh, I think, 150 years. And the other thing that's uh, interesting in this answer is he says so early in the chase, meaning that when he found the damaged blaze, he was either able to date the damage in some way, which seems unlikely to me unless the blaze was based on a, a living thing like a tree, and I don't think it was. But more accurately, he was able to determine what event damaged the blaze and when that event occurred. And those events would be things like earthquakes. There's public records of those. Uh, so if he had, if, you know, let's say that there was some sort of rock situation that was the blaze. I don't know what it is. Insert whatever you, blaze rock you imagine. And an earthquake shakes that part of land and, you know, it falls or breaks or changes in a way that is not distinguishing itself from the surroundings like you want it to. Now Jack has to look for a dismantled rock of some kind. Just an example, but um, I think this is probably one of the most insightful answers we've encountered so far in this document. But let's keep going. Um, I like to get in and talk a little bit in more in depth of a specific clue if I've got other opinions on that. And there's, there's just a lot that was packed into that one statement. Uh, it's amazing. He thought it was a possibility, but was surprised it happened so early in the chase. There's an event that happened, flood, earthquake, uh, I don't know, windstorm, something that um, damaged the blaze that was an unusually powerful event, one that Forrest did not expect. All right. Someone says, I had a pet theory that Forrest endangered the solution by the amount of interviews he gave. Uh, let's jump down. What's the question? Uh, I came to the conclusion that if he were to make an unguarded comment, it would have been early on in the chase and or when asked an unusual question. Is that what you found? Jack responds, thanks, Dean. I think he got into his groove with handling interviews quickly. So he doesn't, he doesn't answer, is that what you found? And I certainly looked at and watched and listened to everything. Hmm. So, if anything, if you're kind of reading between the lines there, it almost seems like that answer is saying yes, but kind of behind the scenes. Is that what y'all are seeing? Because he goes, I think he got into his groove quickly. So, if he did make any mistakes, they, uh, they happened very early on. And I think people have even observed that Forrest answers and responses to questions. Uh, you can do some research on the internet, but I think I've seen breakdowns of that before of just people analyzing how Forrest's storytelling in, as part of his Q and A's and news appearances have, have changed over the years. So that would be part of him getting into the groove. Uh, quick question. He's asking about the, you know, 200, 500 foot searchers and asks if that is a real actual distance. And uh, Jack answers, yes, physical proximity. So there, there were other um, 
there were other searchers very, very, very close to the chest physically, 500 feet away, 200 feet away maybe. All right, now we have a question about the lead searcher. It's a long question and a short answer that doesn't really answer it, so I'm just going to skip that one. Somebody asks if the scissors are called blaze scissors. No, the scissors were not the blaze. They were inside the chest, uh, which means the blaze was outside the chest, but we knew that. Now, um, here's the three questions that I asked and submitted. Uh, first one, uh, would it be accurate to use the word elegant to describe the correct solution to Forrest's poem? If not, is there a better single word to describe it? And Jack responded and said, I'm sure everyone has a different definition of that word, but to me, yes. But it's also humble. So it doesn't take itself too seriously, I suppose. Forrest told Douglas Preston that the Denver Museum of Nature and Science was originally going to be the final clue. Would you share why that place was connected to the correct solution? And Jack responded, said, I didn't ask, but my guess is a clue he was headed north, which is also the title of one of, um, of, one of the chapters. Uh, I think that's in Too Far to Walk. And then the last question I asked Jack, one of the most debated answers Forrest published was regarding the little girl in India. It's from Jenny Kyle's site. Would you be willing to tell why this fictional girl couldn't get closer than the first two clues with just Forrest's poem and a map of the Rocky Mountains? Jack responds, it's very difficult to answer a hypothetical like that because everyone brings their own preconceived notions into it. To me, it's because she has no context. She doesn't even have the book. Oh, sucks to be a poem purist sometimes. Uh, I dabbled in poem purism, but uh, Forrest said that the poem and the book seemed like you were definitely more likely to solve it by using both of those. Now, this next question, uh, this is also another one I'm going to go into a little bit deeper because it has a lot of information uh, that is interesting. And it's been discussed before. A lot of these questions were posted on Thor over the, over the last few months. But seeing them all in one spot uh, really pieces things together. So these are three questions from Redneck Girl. Number one, it's been rumored that Forrest said that you were the only person to correctly identify the home of Brown. As far as you know, is that a true statement? Were you the only person to correctly identify Homer Brown? Jack responds and says, I didn't ask him that, but it wouldn't surprise me. At the same time, it wouldn't surprise me if someone figured that out and hadn't told him. I didn't before I met him. So he's saying neither answer wouldn't surprise him, but um, the gist I get from that is that uh, the Homer Brown is not a common solution. It's not, it's not an answer we've all seen posted on the internet before. Uh, I think it was a much more uncommon one. Uh, did you figure out Homer Brown before you ever went boots on the ground to your search area? And Forrest, or Forrest, Jack answers yes. And this is interesting because we can also pair it with another statement that Jack made. Uh, I don't remember if it was on Medium or maybe his six questions with Jenny Kyle. Uh, but he said that he had identified that the home of Brown was a bottleneck. So he, but he's also said in other areas that he didn't feel fully convinced of his where warm waters halt until he solved later clues. So it almost appears to me that Jack had a one or maybe even more where warm waters halt that he felt good about, but he didn't settle for a, a throwaway home of Brown. And the throwaway home of Browns are where you go, well, this, uh, you know, insert whatever brown animal, brown fish, brown trout, brown bears, uh, whatever brown animal you like, and you replace it and go that this area that I'm searching is a habitat of that animal. But that kind of loses precision. Um, 
I, I, I liked that idea when I got into the chase really early on, uh, looking at the Nez Pierce Creek, because I thought, you know, this is where brown trout were introduced. A lot of people had that same idea. That could be correct, but that's a really specific uh, and easy one to find, and it doesn't sound like this was a common uh, home of brown. But when you kind of do that in general and go, just because this is a creek that has brown trout in it, or this is a forest that has brown bears or grizzly bears in it, what you're really doing is you're just making an excuse for, I, I can't see anything on a map that looks like Homer Brown, so I'm just going to insert something that, that fits that allows me to get to uh, some other point. But you're actually skipping over because you haven't solved that clue. Uh, and that seems to be where a lot of people uh, got stuck, as, as Jack said. He, he identified that point as being a bottleneck. It sounds like he put some extra effort into working uh, that particular clue. Uh, what I'm doing with it right now is I'm trying to go through and identify all the places Forrest has capitalized uh, words in the thrill of the chase, and I'm looking at what they are, whether they're brand names or people's names or nicknames, and how he uses you know, last names differently, you know, in important literature, he capitalizes uh, Salinger, sometimes he calls him J.D. Salinger, sometimes it's just the last name Salinger, and so I'm trying to identify whether there's any evidence that can be extracted from that. Uh, but I do think spending some effort focusing on the correct Homer Brown is, is going to be the next point of making progress in the chase, because we've probably all identified all the where warm waters halts and, you know, Forrest has said more than a few people were at the correct one. And even his phrasing, more than a few, kind of sounds like a lot. And it could just be 10 people, but, it, you know, it's kind of like, I don't really want to say it, but a lot of people have been to where warm waters halt. But, you know, even the ones that were there searching, they, uh, you know, they didn't really have it all put together yet, obviously, because they didn't find the chest. And then the third part of Rednecks Girls, uh, question says, was Brown one of Forrest's names for the chest and home of Brown the location of the chest? That's a rabbit hole I went down as well. Uh, I thought it was an idea original to me when I thought of it. And of course, I went online and searched and Jenny Kyle had posted a theory based around that as a potential because Forrest had talked about if you if you can find home of Brown, then, you know, what do you need this other stuff for? Um I probably tried to work on that into various theories for like a year. Uh, it's uh, it's compelling, but I'm kind of glad that Jack ruled that out because now I can go, okay, that's, uh, you know, Forrest isn't just using this capitalized noun as a nickname for something, or at least not as the name of the chest. I do think Brown could be a nickname, uh, but it's not uh, it's not the chest's nickname. And as I was saying after talking about question number two, this sort of response also falls into um, being a placeholder for not having a better solution to Homer Brown because you can you can make these fit any solution. You can go, uh, well, I'm going to put in here because I've identified a water high and that's where the chest is, is at, and so I am below the home of Brown. But what you realize is you can insert this in almost any solution, so you're, you're, you're trying to manufacture a reason to skip a clue. And I figured that out, but it took me like a year. I uh, wasted a bunch of time on that angle. All right, uh, are place names on a map relevant? Jack says, I think I can answer that either way, and people would quibble. Yeah, it really doesn't matter what you say. People will quibble, that is for sure. Is any part of the solve outside of Wyoming? Nope. Everything is in Wyoming. Um, this person gives a really long explanation of an idea, and Jack just says, I think you're overcomplicating it. And I can't follow it either, so I also think they're overcomplicating it. Jack answers that the chest was covered with forest debris. Um, kind of makes me feel like it was up against a tree. 
um, Forrest has talked in, I think it was in the thrill of chase. I don't think it was too far to walk, but you know, sitting up against a tree, he said in Montana, but um, that's the that's the sort of area where forest debris falls rapidly. I know any of you who've searched out in, in the Rocky Mountains, you can you can probably dig away two feet of forest debris underneath some of these trees. They're just piles up over the years. He uses that word nook again. Um, Jack also says, in response to a question, I won't read the question, but he says, I did not take any photos specifically to release to the public. Uh, so it sounds like his, his plan all along was to keep completely silent, which is kind of weird, but I get it. Uh, more things about the timing, getting permission, blah, blah, blah. Him driving. I don't really care about this stuff. I would like to know where the chest was. It's a fun part of the story, though. If Jack wrote a book, I would, I would buy the book and read it because I would like to at least hear his journey, even if he can't tell the details of it. There's a discussion about very close proximity to a human trail. Um, somebody asks for a hint to Homer Brown. He refuses. Here's a question that's interesting. A uh, person asks, did Forrest say why the hide spot was special? If Forrest did, would you share why? And Jack responds and says, sure, we talked about it, but he probably didn't tell me everything. Or there are some things it's difficult to put into words. I, um, Jack's mentioned before, uh, I think in one of his Medium articles, he calls up the story in My War for Me. Um, where Forrest uh, trips over the stone grave marker that had fallen flat on its face. Uh, so he fell flat on his face on top of a stone that fell flat on his face. And as he's pushing himself up, he sees another grave marker, but it's now a rude aluminum one, and it's directly in front of him. And this whole experience had some sort of spiritual, uh, psychedelic, uh, you know, mind meld that happened for him that was just like, whoa. <laughs> and then later on, he ties that story back to the Philadelphia caper, I think is the word that he uses for it, the Philadelphia caper, where he puts his thumb over top of the city of Philadelphia. And Jack specifically mentions both of those, those incidents in one of his answers. And if you read My War for Me, Forrest uses the word others, referring to um, not just the waterfall incident, but he goes, there was others that, you know, created this same sort of going to this place in his mind. And I think this might be the third one because he had the Philadelphia one, and he had the waterfall in Vietnam one, and Jack says that the poem tells a story. So the poem may be telling the story of that third experience, one that was not from his, you know, Air Force training time, and one that was not from his actual Air Force serving time, but a time that he had visited a place a few times in the, in the Rocky Mountains and had an experience, which he describes in a cryptic poem. And if you can solve it uh, and build a time machine, you can have a treasure chest. Or you can do what I did and just buy a, a, a fake chest. <laughs> I don't like calling it a fake chest, a commemorative chest. All right. Uh, let's go to the last question. The last three questions, uh, all in one incident. First one, can HOB, Homer Brown, be physically seen or recognized on a map? And Jack responds and says, any part of Wyoming can be seen on a map. Hmm. 
just trying to think if there's any detail into there. It's interesting to look at how, you know, people, what word choices people use. Uh, it's almost, I don't think this is what he's saying, but it almost sounds like he's saying that home of Brown is a part of Wyoming because he says any part of Wyoming can be seen on a map. I'll give some fodder to the people who use county lines in their solves. All right, number two. Warm waters is the first water. Is water high the cold you encounter to get to the blaze, or is there a third water at the blaze? And he says, I don't want to answer that one. Sorry. No. All right, so here's one that he's going to answer. Forrest said a couple of times that the moment when everyone finds out the location of where the chest was hidden, that we would all laugh and say, why didn't I think of that? Did you have that moment? And he says, yes. Seems like you'd want to talk more about that. Uh, no wonder he's shy. Uh, I like the comment, though, that uh, the searcher kid left as part of uh, when he submitted this answer. He says, I asked number three to reiterate the fact that Forrest intended for everyone <laughs> to find out the location. So uh, little, a little tricky, subtle psychology there. All right. Well, we have reached the end of the questions, so uh, I'll sign off for now. But um, I don't know if anyone will find this interesting. That was as much for me as anything to just sort of talk through uh, what I was thinking in the moment. So thanks for watching.